Um, okay, so uh, I'm really delighted uh, today that we have got um, Fiona Dalgetti, the Chief Executive of Face Ross. Um, we've also got Simon Bradley, a uh, lecturer and the Programme Leader at UHI. Um, and we've also got Lauren Moore, um, who is the Principal Teacher of Music at Mallet High School. Um, and uh, it's just, I think, a really good opportunity to hear from people um, who are leading in the sector of music education sector across the Highlands and Islands um, about their views on not just about COVID but also about the future of music education across the Highlands and Islands, what things they would like to see happen and, and all of that stuff as well. So if you have got questions at some point, feel free to type them into the chat and we'll, we'll come to those um, in a wee while. We'll come to those questions uh, in the second half of this hour. We will be keeping strictly to time, you'll be pleased to know. And so we will definitely be finishing at or just before 2 p.m. So um, I'm just gonna ask the panel to unmute themselves and we'll, we'll just, I, I suppose it would be um, useful, I think, initially, if we could just sort of, uh, if we could just kick off about, you know, maybe a, just a short description from each of you, keep it brief if you can, about how you managed to do that digital pivot or if you did that or what you, you managed to do over the last 18 months uh, in your particular in your particular field. So Lauren, do you want to just kick us off in, from the school, from the coalface, tell us um, um, how, how it's been and um, what sort of things you managed? So, um, well, I know it was a big massive change for everybody, but I think school really, really took it hard as well. Um, we were quite fortunate, I think, in Highland before the pandemic because we'd already started to implement the use of Google Classroom and all our children had Chromebooks. So although we weren't using them as extensively as what we are now, we still had an idea of what was possible and what we could do. And um, that was a little kind of insight to, you know, it, it kind of expanded from there. Um, I think now the kids are far more used to using technology um, and using Google Classroom. Uh, that, I mean, I would, I think, I know in other regions they use Microsoft Teams and things, but in Highland, they've just completely adopted Google Classroom. So um, I think it didn't come without its problems. Um, music especially was quite difficult. And I think maybe some, maybe I, I can't speak for everybody, but some of my tutors, I think, um, took to the kind of one-to-one -one lessons a lot easier than others. You know, it was a real sort of change in education for them as well. So um, moving forward, I think kids are much more used to using technology now. For instance, we, um, in a class the other day, we called one of the tutors just to, because they're starting a new project next term. So we wanted to say hello. And we just did that, just to say, up a Google Meet, so there are positives too. So hopefully we can have a we can continue with two things. Yeah, great. Thanks so much. Digital. Right, and and Simon, what about you up at uh, in 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 the US for UHI? How did how did you? What was the kind of digital pivot for you? Hello, everyone. So my my usual teaching role is on a couple, well, a master's and a degree, and they have large this is prior to, to COVID, we were set up within the University of the Highlands and Islands to use extensively video conference technology to meet our remit of inclusion and accessibility across the region. Uh, so we were relatively well placed. Uh, however, we did have residential elements and face-to-face -face individual classes. We had to find alternatives to those. And that was that was the biggest challenge for ourselves, for example, especially the kind of final uh, celebration where the, the students finish their honours year with a performance in a real theatre, in, in our case, Anlanta in Stornoway, which has a you know, great sound man, lights, etc. Uh, and we had to do online versions of that. So we were able to manage, we were relatively well set up. UHR, I think, is the biggest university in Europe, as far as I'm aware, in the use of this online technology. So we were relatively I remember, fortunate. I remember it from doing external examining in Perth and being amazed to, a decade ago that you had people dialing in from Inverness to Perth, you know? <laughs> Can it change days now, I suppose, Simon? 
Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I mean, one, one thing, just to, one of the, the other main struggles that I found is that prior to COVID, you know, we were connecting to people across the region and in some cases internationally uh, using this technology, but you were connecting to people that had full, full lives. And of course, everyone's, the people at the end of the technology, their lives have been curtailed. Uh, and so that was, you know, the mental health, the, the concentration, these aspects uh, have really come into play this year. But, you know, relatively, we were well set up. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Good. Thanks. Fiona, do you want to just uh, give us an overview for Fish Ross and, and just other things, how, how it's felt and how you've kind of adapted? Sure, yeah. I mean, at Face Ross, we're all about bringing people together in a space to make music. So we had to adapt really quickly. Um, and I have to say, like the team, my colleagues have been incredible and the freelance musicians, the, the amount of upskilling that had to be done really quickly. Um, Lauren mentioned uh, Google Classroom and Microsoft Teams, and we work um, in Highland in partnership with High Life Highland and Fashion and Gale to deliver the Youth Music Initiative in schools. Um, using Google Classroom up here, but we also have contracts in Aberdeenshire and Dumfries and Galloway where they use a different platform altogether. So um, our freelance musicians delivering those programmes had to to adapt really quickly and learn an awful lot of new skills. So we were able to, with the schools programme, which is like a general introduction to traditional music for primary school whole classes, um, we were able to continue that. Um, initially, we made lots of pre-recorded material, but then we decided to deliver live lessons every week um, when the young people were at home, so we had got them all on individually um, after Christmas, and then when they were back in school as well, being beamed onto smart boards and doing lessons. Um, so our education manager, Rachel, kind of managed that huge programme of, of all of that. And um, we also have a community programme, so our community engagement officer had uh, to very quickly pivot three large projects. So normally we'd have 35 classes a week in communities across Rosshire, so we put them all on Zoom. Um, wow. But Simon, like you mentioned, people had other things going on in their lives and it became very obvious to us that we couldn't just cut and paste our programme and make it a digital programme. So yeah. the weekly classes weren't replicated on Zoom. It was it became a different model of, of some pre-recorded material that people could work through in their own time um, and also live interactions every two weeks rather than weekly and shorter than a normal class. Yeah. Um, and what do you think? I mean, just this is one for all of you, but just chip in. What do you think the effect has been on learners, whether kids at different stages or adults as well? I mean, what's your view of, of, of how it's affected musical education, if you like? I think Lauren's probably noticed this in school. Yeah, I was going to... What I've noticed is that there's a real gap. So some people have really flown with it and have had the opportunity to have masterclass level tuition with people that they would never normally get to learn from. and have have really developed and and others have dropped out completely and don't engage and um, so it's really i would say it's really varied um to- i totally agree with that and i think simon briefly touched on it earlier as well he's mentioned the mental health aspect of it my day-to-day job really was it kind of sh- and i should have said this earlier but it almost shifted from like teaching music to actually just checking in on kids their, their well-being so some days you were able to you know you were able to engage with them on a musical level but you've no idea what they're going through at the other end of that so some days was easier than others and I think that was it, it was you know is this um you know music assessment that I'm about to give you or you know this test or is this it wasn't all like that but is this like little quiz that I'm going to give you is that the most important thing or is it just asking you know, oh, um, have you been listening to anything that you like and getting them to talk to you? So they also never, like, hardly ever showed their faces. So you were having to con- work so much harder to engage. So I think making sure that people were okay mentally before they even started thinking about a task was far more important than what it had been in day-to-day life. I think that, for me, was a massive thing. Mm. Um, yeah just it was difficult it was yeah. Hard, yeah, hard hard work i think and 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 as fiona's saying like really variable um simon have you got any views on that as well either yeah i mean i think there were definitely winners and losers and certain people were minded or placed to better take advantage of the opportunities that arose uh you know people were suddenly 
you could contact them. It was more a normal thing to contact quite high profile, profile and very busy people using the technology. Whereas, you know, you might have said, oh, I can't ask them, they'd be too busy. Uh, however, I mean, anecdotally, anecdotally, you know, we did notice uh, the mental health issues in students. Uh, and, the, you know, the, the, there are studies starting to come out now. This one actually was done in Germany. Uh, and it was about studying music during the coronavirus pandemic. Uh, and one quote that came out of it was the survey revealed that the coronavirus pandemic led to a decrease in practicing hours and an increase of stressful thoughts and feelings. So that was 75, 80 students. So overall, perhaps, you know, it did, you know, there was an impact there that uh, the things that had been curtailed, uh, you know, it was a toll across the board although there were winners and losers within it yeah yeah if i can just put in there as well there was there was definitely some pupils that it was like the thing that they would do was practice so they've come back from remote learning and they're like super great like some of them have just completely taken off and are playing things that they and it's amazing to see that but because that was their go-to thing you know right. some people have gone to couch to 5k and all this like some people went to practice their chanter are going to practice the guitar and some pupils completely switched off so th and there's no in between there was just right, right. so very, very polarized right between yeah. between like uh, good and, and bad experiences just turning 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 just to the future then um i mean i i i i'm finding it fascinating talking to you know people involved in music across the highlands and islands about what sort of things that they want to uh, see happen. It does feel to me like there's a real appetite for not just getting back to normal, the way things were, but there seems to be an appetite for some kind of different um, future, if you like, in, in musical future, in, in different ways in the hands and hands. Do you want to say a few words, um, uh, Fiona, about that, about you know, what sort of things that maybe the organization or you personally are thinking about? Um, is, it, is it just a return to normal for you or is it is it something different in the future for, for the face and, and maybe personally? Do you know, I think um, generally I hope very much it is a return to normal. Um, for the young people that we work with, uh, the social aspect of it is huge. So the residential courses that we run are so important to be able to come from all corners of the Highlands and stay in Aliko for a week and meet your people that are into the same music as you and um, genuinely form amazing friendships. You know, when they'll meet up in Inverness on a Saturday or whatever it might be and, and make other musical collaborations together throughout the year. They're desperate for that. Um, and we found that our online lessons, you know, teenagers, the amount of stress they've been under with Google Classroom and schoolwork and everything, the last thing I think they wanted by the time they'd socialised with their pals online, done their schoolwork online, the very few wanted to sign up to an extracurricular music activity online as well. But what we're hearing from them is that they, they just want to, to be back in a space and away from home and having fun um, and being together. So I think we are really hopeful that we'll be able to, to be back face to face and communicate. That's 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 fascinating. And, and especially and... though, Simon, that the the difference we do a lot of work with adult learners as well as young people yeah so what we've found is that our um, numbers of young people engaging online has gone down um during the pandemic compared to face to face but our number of adult learners has increased um, right. our adult um classes very often would tail off over the winter and i think folk just don't want to come out on dark nights in the snow and drive to Tullough castle mm -hmm. and Dingwall's our class and, and those classes increased in numbers yeah, it's funny that I, I found exactly the same thing when I surveyed um, the, the scene, if you like, in 2014, uh, 15. And I found that actually the biggest sort of end users of digital uh, consumption or uh, of, of traditional music were um, were all the 60 plus bracket, actually, you know. Um, I, I mean, what, what's what what's it been like? Um, what's it going to look like for you, Simon? terms of um are you going to keep any bits of this you were already teaching online a lot anyway as you say so well, what's your thoughts on it yeah well i think you know we were quite unusually placed in that uh you know what a lot of what has become normal for everyone was our uh normal state uh anyway 
However, the face-to-face the -face elements and the end user nourishment from social contact, yes, I can echo uh, you know, Fiona and Lauren, you know, I'm very hopeful and uh, certainly would like to see those returning. Uh, you know, I miss them personally as well. I think one of the things about the digital realm is, and I think we talked about this, Fiona, uh, a few weeks ago, was that it's very efficient in that, you know, you can contact people that you would perhaps not have been able to contact, but you're also multitasking. You know, you, you might be doing a Zoom, but your email's on, you might have several platforms on. So it can be very good for productivity. But of course, the other side of that is, is the exhaustion that comes from it. And if you wear glasses, as I do, there's eye strain as well. So I think you need to take, it's striving to find a balance. So we'll, we'll find a new balance depending on what we're permitted, what freedoms, uh, and when we get them back. But fingers crossed they, they come back soon in time for summer. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And Lauren, do you want to say a few words about, about what, what the kind of what you're hoping yeah, for, things to get back parent, to normal? Yeah, I think every parent, grandparent and child in the whole country would just say get back to school, you know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, even that, yeah. For all the reasons that everybody else has said, I think music just as a school subject, you know, in high school, it's one of these subjects that perhaps, you know, you don't have lessons outside of school, but it's something that you really enjoy. It's a part of the curriculum, you know, something like group making, making music together. It's just, a, it was, it was impossible to do online without as, you know, upskilling and making videos and doing all that kind of thing. And that's a positive to it that we've, you know, that we're all a wee bit better at digital stuff, but just, we just needed to get back to school for social things, for group making activities and just doing things for the community. We're so based in a small place like Malig. We, you know, the kids are constantly doing stuff for the community, whether that's school shows or pantomimes or just playing for like the residential home across the road. Like we yeah. just need to get back to that and I really miss it and the kids do. Yeah. Yeah, can you say a few words about that, Lauren? Just for for those on the call that don't know about you know, how, how do you balance that in somewhere like Malik about, you know, the relationship between the formal education curriculum and your own actual community stuff? There's a lot of music I know goes on there. So yeah, yeah. how do they articulate those things together? You know, do they have, is there sort of a relationship there? Are they quite I, distinct? I've always believed that the community, playing for the community feeds into the formal education. If you get a kid that can play, can stand up and play a tune in front of, a, a group of people then they'll stand up and play that tune in an exam you know you can tie things in together and it's all about confidence building it's about socializing making a making a bit of an event um and it will it will feed in um and a good example of that was this is way before covid but i took kids down to the concert hall in glasgow and we did a lunchtime concert and it was the first, it was the furthest away, I think they'd ever had somebody's lunchtime concert. And we did like a whole, it was just an hour of like, we made based on traditional music. And I had to take quite a lot of my own music making time and dedicate it to this kind of project that we were going to do. And every single kid absolutely loved it. And they did so well in their exams that year because they'd, they'd fed into it. It was, it was real life, made it real life. And I think that's, a massive thing that I'm missing at the moment is that music at the moment is um, it's kind of it's you know it's a uh, through a screen it's like oh you mute yourself and then I'll play I'll mute myself and then you can play we're missing that connection thing and I think in a small I think in any place but especially here um, missing the community music feeding into the school curriculum type thing. Yeah, and and Fiona, I mean, is that similar f for for the face? You know, it's it, I mean, it's very much community music, right? But it's sort of genre based your your thing, isn't it? So, um, is it? Are you do, do you feel that there's a very sort of strong connection in Rosshire, or or is it? I know people go from all over the country and abroad to to your events. So, you know, just say a few words about that. Yeah, there's there's real rootedness though in in what what we do, you know, Face Ross is celebrating its 35th anniversary this year. And although we've grown as an organisation, it's still very much grassroots in Rosshire. So, you know, we feel very much part of the community and 
Edmonton and Fort Rose and Dingwall and all the places that we'd normally be. Um, and the same thing, you know, our culture and fiddlers would be playing, at switching on of the Christmas lights and all those normal community things that you'd be having in a normal year. Um, and when the adult facies in Ullapool, we, we work with all the, the venues there and have, have music all over the village and people are really involved in it. So, yeah, that's definitely something people are missing. But I think you, you touched on the international reach there and I think that's been really interesting for us this year about how we sustain that going forward. So things that we'll keep... Um, we will probably have some kind of virtual programme that we will keep um, as part of our core programming now going forward because we now have this international audience that we didn't have before. So we were quite quick last year in May when people were in full lockdown to put our adult face weekend online and, and the response was huge. We had people from more than 50 countries accessing that and taking part and then some of them have subsequently signed up for our weekly classes online so we've got people from Germany and Cornwall in our weekly Parsach classes that would normally be people on the Black Isle on a Tuesday night so you know how do we keep those people involved yeah and how do you choose like so if you're in if you're in uh, I don't know down in, in Penzance or whatever and you want to learn the Clarsach you know how do you know? Well, I'll go to Face Ross, you know. Do you think you have to develop an offer for that or is it just the reputation sort of goes forward or what? Well, I think those folks find out about it through the, the concerts and things that we've been putting on through the, the adult face. So we've, we've put on lots of different online concerts this year and I think people have been drawn to those as an audience and then realise there's participatory opportunities as well. Um, but for young people, we are running a Kaylee Trail this summer, so our training programme for 16 to 25 year olds, we're doing a face-to-face -face, um, four-week project in the summer, so we'll have nine young people come together for a week of intense training, and then they will tour for three weeks in a, in a very COVID-safe way um, in the Highland Council area. And we've they auditioned in February 2020, thinking that they would be part of this project last summer. So we've kept them engaged all year online so they've got to know each other but we've been able to do things like we've had a series for a week where we had workshops between 12 and 2 because of the time zone differences we were able to get young people from our partner um, organizations in Australia and Canada to nominate teenagers the same age so they've been like participating in online workshops I mean that is, is hugely impressive uh, and, and well done I mean I'm finding it really difficult to be honest with you there's such an international smorgasbord board if that's the right term you know of like say well for university people you know for research seminars or talks that i want to go to i can't actually attend them all there's just so many now taking place online simon you've got you've always had quite a lot of international students um for the applied music and also now i imagine for the postgrad stuff um what's what's your view on that are they why why are they are they gonna Are they gonna keep doing it at, at a distance and do the residentials, or, or how's it gonna work? Well, uh, the the masters has optional residences with digital equivalents, so that's that's always been uh, set up for international students, and we have international students just now. And we have in the past, you know, to the extent where you have to schedule, you know, you have to be aware of time zones. So that's uh, the BA Applied Music, the degree which has the mandatory residential elements, uh, you know, that's COVID permitting, you know, we're kind of beholden to what we're permitted to do. Uh, you know, we're very skilled. We, we use virtual residences uh, quite often where we have digital equivalents to the face-to-face the -face meetings. So we're, we've got frameworks and skills and, and templates set up for that. Uh, I mean, I think that Brexit has certainly complicated, uh, you know, the issue. Uh, so I know what we'd like to do. Uh, let's see what we're allowed to do. I think also, that's part of it. Surely, surely the really, the really beautiful situation you're in out there in the Outer Hebrides, that must attract a lot of students as well, no? Yeah, yeah it's undoubtedly, it's a unique, uh, place especially in, in the summer uh you know you know there's a lot there's a lot of uh, people come here to to visit and the students really love to come and base themselves it's a unique special place culturally rich uh you know it's, it's a unique landscape uh that's obviously been curtailed of late 
Uh, we're hoping we've got new infrastructure on the island, Croxola, uh, and we're hoping that that will spur on a return uh, mm -hmm. and provide a nest for people that want to and are able to relocate in the islands. And that also aligns with lots of, you know, the island plan, mm -hmm. you know, lots of wider uh, priorities that affect the, the islands in particular. I mean, one of the other things I think I'd like to hear from you all about as well is um, what are the kind of challenges facing learners in across the Highlands and Islands? Because, you know, in the in the research I'm doing at the moment, I'm talking to a lot of people, particularly, you know, when you talk to promoters or you talk to um, musicians, and obviously the distances uh, involved are huge and add a lot of cost onto things. But I suppose I'm also structurally interested in kind of how it works for you and what, what you're seeing from your, your particular chair in terms of what the biggest challenges will be, assuming we get back to a normal position, Lauren, you know, assuming we get the kids back in the classroom uh, and, and things return to some kind of normality by, by August, or um, what, what are the biggest issues facing those kids with music in, in your area? Well, locality you know where we are is a is a challenge it's hard to um we i mean we're really fortunate here i've talked about like community things but we really have such a strong partnership both with our local face here which is it's just a tiny little branch of the face called face oigri namara which is just the young people of the sea <laughs> um, and it's ailey shaw that runs that here so we've got you know quite We've got professional musicians nearby us that are helping us with things. Ailey Sean, Ross Martin, they live in Mora. We've got a really strong group of tutors um, provided to us by Face Oigri Namara, and we just provide the venue here and they do all the, the nitty gritty stuff. So we've got Jim Hunter who does guitar, and we've got Angus Binney who teaches pipes and whistle, and we've got Sarah Jane Shanklin who teaches fiddle. and. Who else? Hugh McCallum's our drumming specialist. So we're so fortunate here to have that and just create these links. And we've got really strong links where we're starting to get even stronger links with High Life Highland. Boom. We're just about to start a, a brass project with our S1. So everybody in S1 coming in after the summer is going to learn the trumpet or the trombone, every single one of them. Great. Make that like a class project, which is something that's not been done in Highland at all. We're just. I'd love to see that. I'd love to be yeah. a fly in the wall for that. Yeah. Tell us, for, for those of us that don't know, can you just explain structurally where you know the the the, the secondary thing sits with in relation to High Life Highland as well, please? So, um, in Highland region, we don't have any music instructors that are employed as such by Highland Council. I think now I'm pretty sure I'm right with that, and they're all been moved to High Life Highland, um, which. I think has been a good move as far as I, you know, I've spoken to tutors and um, spoken to Norman Bolton quite a lot, who's head of, um, he's like the music guy of Highland. <laughs> and uh, Norman's always been quite, he thinks it's a, this has been a good move. It's given them a little bit more flexibility. They're able to do things like we're talking just now, like a project, like we're doing it, we're basing it on a project that was um, a brass project, which has been happening in Inverlochy Primary School in Fort William. Um, it's Mark Reynolds is the brass instructor, and he's quite keen to take something like this um, and move it sort of around the Lochaber area a wee bit more. Um, and uh, yeah, so we're really looking forward to that. Um, does that not? Does that not mean, Lauren? Correct me if I'm wrong, though. Does that not then mean that there are no publicly employed music tutors? In, in Highland region because High Life Highlands are... I'm not sure about that. I couldn't yeah. probably say Norman's about... Norman's on the call, Simon. Norman's oh, it... oh, yeah. Oh, maybe he, he could explain. <laughs> but don't want to call on you if you, if you if you don't want to join in in the debate. Um, might not be suitable, but um, yeah, go on. You can... Is that Norman there? Yeah. It is indeed, yeah. I don't want to interrupt Lauren. If you want to finish Lauren just now, or do you want me to explain? Oh, go for it. It'd be good to have your input. Yeah, okay. We um yeah. the, the whole structure there's there's just under fifty instrumental instructors um employed across Highland, covering all sorts of instrumental genres um and different projects. And although we're employed by High Life Highland, uh, which is an arms length uh, organization, um we deliver instrumental tuition on behalf of Highland Council to Highland Council's pupils. 
um, somewhere usually between three and four thousand of them in a week, um, and that over the COVID period obviously has been hundred percent online until recently, and now it's you know we've had access to schools again, limited access to schools, so um, that's been good. And as others have said, you know it's been good for instructors and for pupils to to have that um, face to face social contact as well. But um, we. Our team embraced technology within the, the technology of the Google uh, Google Meets and uh, the whole G Suite um, set up in Highland within two weeks of the, the first lockdown, and everything went 100% online. Um, and I have to admit that we've had some phenomenal results. Um, it's not been for everybody in terms of pupils. You know, we, we, I can't deny that. You know, we have lost a few pupils for various reasons, and we've had a few who've put their lessons on hold because the technology just wasn't working for them. Um, but in most cases, we've had some phenomenal results with pupils um, who didn't engage particularly well in face-to-face -face lessons, actually coming up with really good results in online lessons, which doesn't really make an awful lot of sense or logic in my old-fashioned head. Um, but it's it's worked really well, and we've discovered some hidden talents amongst their instructors as well. They've developed skills that uh, they've kept well hidden for a number of years. So I'm going to go forward. We're embracing the technology. We're going to use it um, to the best of our ability. We'll be developing a blended approach in a number of cases where some instruments work really well. Um, and where instructors are happy to do that, and uh, that's that's that sort of way ahead. In a, with a view to expanding, because as Lawrence pointed out, you know, we the geography in Highland is such that it makes it incredibly difficult to reach some places effectively. Um, but if we can do that with the help of technology, that's our intention, so that we can actually uh, we've already started offering um, access to to tuition in places that we would never have dreamt we could do in the past. So uh, there are some plus points coming out, and lots of plus points coming out of this uh, whole situation, I think. And uh, hopefully we're going to get a nice balance between um, different ways of delivery in the future. And is that is that open to all, though, Norman? That was my kind of question initially, though. Is that, do the, are the families paying for that tuition? Or is um, the we, public subsidy on that? Yeah, the, the, it's obviously highly subsidised. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, there is we, we do charge tuition fees along with the vast majority of local authorities. Um, although obviously that may change, and uh, well, it will change because there's obviously a, a government commitment to make that change. Um, and I believe that's being worked on now um, and and being put through um, as a project in the government um, as we speak. So um, you know we're we're all waiting to hear how that's going to affect. Um, and and open up access, yeah. um, but we we also have a, a that, very really... comprehensive fees exemption policy in place. So we would never turn anybody away in Highland. Um, that, there are that, ways that and means. That's my concern, you know, about it because that thing about you know, I, it seems to me sometimes you know when as things progress and the digitalisation, I you sometimes think you know how does a really talented but really poor kid get on. You know, because I kind of I come from a piping background, and I always think, you know, the the piping's always had a really strong tradition of free tuition in the pipe bands, the local community pipe bands. You know, and it just seems that to me, and I'm not no expert in music education, but it always has seemed to me like that that the position on 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 music education has become more and more entangled, more and more commodified, if you like. I don't know what you panelists guys have got any views on that or, or or not, but that sounds like a really positive move, Norman. If if we're moving towards free tuition again. Sorry, do you want me to respond to that? I mean, just in the sense of, do you see you see that as a good yeah. thing? Yeah. Um, yeah. I I'm I'm not in a position to make any comment on that at the moment because we don't actually have details of how it's going to work. Um, yet, so it, it wouldn't really be fair to, to have, um, and I'm certainly not going to give you my personal opinion in this <laughs> forum. Um, but you know, we, we in Highland, um, I and I think this works in similar ways across Scotland at the moment with tuition fees are in place. 
Um, in Highland, we really don't turn people away. Um, we have ways of making sure that we capture as many people as possible within the system who want lessons. And there's a massive fees exemption policy in place um, based on, on benefits and fee school meal entitlements as well. Um, but I'm not going to deny the fact that yeah, it's to, to some families, it's that middle group who fall down a crack um, where it's just the last thing they need is to, is to consider that. So, yeah, there are, but that's that's where we, we have a bit of um, flexibility. I have a bit of flexibility, you know, where folk are interested in lessons and we can make it happen for them. And we do make it happen for a number of, of families like that. Reiterate that in my position that I am here, you know, some that issue does it does come up from time to time, you know, um, especially as our tuition is given by High Life Highland and Faisal Gurmara, apart from in in the, in the classroom with me itself. But there are ways and means, and actually, because the, you know, I've I've never had a problem of like I've always managed to find some way around it. So I, I know it's, I can't really say much more than that, but like that, yeah, it's not ever, I've never uh, had a pupil that was not wanting to carry on with music education because of their yeah. financial uh, situations. We've that's that's heartening, them. heartening to hear that. Um, one of the other things that I think it'd be really worth exploring is the transitions between those, you know, these different your different areas you've got community music we've got higher tertiary education we've got secondary we've got even primary um i mean presumably right with the distances involved um the, that's going to be different for a kid who lives in cardonald than it is for you know somebody moving through the system in uh, in forest or something like that. i don't know I mean, what's what's your view on that We're obviously a really traditional music heavy panel today. Yeah. <laughs> from the face perspective, and I think there's a really lovely, very visible thing that happens within the face movement where um, we have an instrument bank and people come along and might try a fiddle for the first time, come to a weekly class, come to a residential, progress through or from our beginners, intermediate, advanced classes, end up in the performance group on the Cayley Trail, do some of the training that we do. We do a lot of collaboration with Norman. So, um, during lockdown, actually, that's maybe something to touch on. There's a, a joint project that, that we run that's the Highland Youth Music Forum. So if anybody here is not aware of it, check out the website. And there's a, a group on Facebook you can request to be added to. Um, and that's been a great kind of shared learning space for people teaching music um, formally and informally. Um, and it, especially as they've had to be learning so many other skills this year. So there's a lot of peer learning going on there. And, and we had a conference um, in the spring as well online but there's, yeah. there's a real kind of so people can there is a ladder of progression there lots of people teaching but i suppose in a way fiona you know you you, you point out yourself you know the, the one of the things i'm noticing as well in the hounds it is so heavily uh traditional music folk music based the a lot of the the education um and I'm wondering if you are really keen let's say you really wanted to play in an orchestra or something like that and you were you were you were wanted to play first flute in an orchestra. I mean, how is that going to work? Actually, how does that work at the moment for for a kid uh, in the Highlands? I mean, how does that how does it work? Jump in. And we've got. I was just typing a wee note there. We've got a group of um, eight uh, regional ensembles, in addition to any school and area groups that exist for orchestral players and trad players as well called Highland Young Musicians, where we have everything from symphony orchestra, full concert wind band, string orchestra, Gaelic choir, youth choir, um, pipe band drumming, and uh, big band. Um, so, you know, there's it covers so many different, and uh, so, sorry, and um, a group called Snaz, which is their sort of Cayley band um, group as well. And those, those are sort of, um, used to be auditioned but they're not going to be auditioned any longer that's going to be by invitation from now on um but that's a sort of pyramid um beyond school and area um ensembles that, that kids can aspire to and then of course there are all the fashion groups that you know, many many pupils um do not necessarily exclusively but also you know in um in addition to anything that we can offer them as well 
So I think there's a, there's a really strong partnership um, between different providers in Highland. You know, we're very lucky to have that. And I think, Simon, as well, lots of young people, they don't see genres. So, you know, they're listening to Radio 1 and they're getting classical violin lessons at school and they come to the face after school. And um, one of the projects, I'm just thinking about what you were saying there about, you know, progression for, for advanced young people. And one of the projects that we're doing just now that we started during lockdown is a Gaelic songwriting project called Karen Macrunia, um, where young people from across Scotland actually are have come together to be mentored by Marianne Kennedy and Ewan Henderson to write their own song. Um, and those songs are not traditional songs. They're totally, every song is completely different in style and some of them are really contemporary. Um, and, and that's been amazing to see. It's a partnership project with um, Make Your Stop. So all, the common thread is that all the songs are about environmental issues that matter to that young person. Hmm. So that's been interesting to see. Yeah, no, it sounds great. And Simon, do you want to say a few words about how do you see do you see like local students coming to you in in Hebrides or or from mainland? I mean, who who are your students at the moment? But, uh, very broad. I think that's a strength of UHI University of Highlands and Islands, which tends to compared to the kind of Scottish average has more people with disabilities, more females. There's a, a mature demographic more than the the national picture. Uh, and more part-time access. So I think one of the strengths of uh, UHI and our delivery model is the inclusion and accessibility that it facilitates. On terms of the two actual programmes that, that I participate and lead in, they are multi-genre. And I think, uh, you know, I can uh, agree with, with Fiona that, you know, people coming up seek and welcome cross genre collaboration uh, and my, a, a recent uh, project that uh, that Anna Wendy Stevenson my colleague uh, led on was a, 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 a commission by Community Land Scotland so very much uh, a local theme but we brought in international students so we had you know a, a Czech girl based in Shetland we had a German girl who used to stay in Uist is now back home because of COVID. You know, they're playing singer-songwriter, they've got trumpets, classical background, but they're all coming together under this theme that's by enabled by the technology and by the programme and the approach to come together to, you know, a very particular and you might say Highlands and Islands resonant theme. And they wrote music and they used the technology. They couldn't obviously rehearse face to face, but one of the, another strength I would say of of the models, the teaching models that we have is remote digital collaboration where we can file share, manipulate them, and we enable the students to use the technology uh, to still be creative in a collaborative way, uh, even though they might not be able to uh, meet face to face. So I think, you know, the, there are lots of positives as well about, uh, you know, yeah. you, the use of the technology it can Great. provide unique solutions. You know, one thing as well, I, I was hoping to cover and it just sort of uh, came back to me there when you were speaking about it is the, is the links with the language and the Gaelic uh, language links. And obviously the Fashion has that right at the absolute core of its foundation, you know, the links with, with the language. But do, do, you, do you want to maybe start us off, Fiona, and say, you know, I mean, obviously in the Highlands and Islands, it's presumably critical for, for the Fashion. You know, the, do you do... Do you still do, you do Gaelic language tuition, medium education, and also English, but how does it work and what's the kind of philosophy for, for the music education side with the language? Good question, Simon. <laughs> um, yeah, Gaelic is featured really strongly across our programmes, um, particularly so the work that Fashion and Gael do in the region, um, who we work with really closely as well. Um, so we do... We will introduce some amount of the language across all of the work that we do and that might be at a really basic level you know kids that come along to our mainstream trad music classes if you like every week who don't have gaelic will be encouraged to learn how to count in in gaelic and um uh, learn words associated with the, the the melodies they might be learning that kind of thing through to the, pro the project that i just spoke about which is is solely for fluent uh, gaelic speakers 
that are confident to, to write creatively in the language. Um, so there was no English spoken at all during that project. The tutors were Gaelic speaking. Um, and um, other languages, though, thinking about contemporary Ross-Shire today, one of the, the um, my colleagues just now is in Huynh Park in Inverness with some mums and their new babies. Um, we've been running a project in partnership with Carnegie Hall that they set up years ago called the Lullaby Project, where we pair professional musicians with new mums to give them the confidence in music making with their children and to write their own personal lullaby for their child. And um, that's just been amazing to watch actually over the last year. And we've had lullabies written in Rosshire in Portuguese and Arabic and Gaelic and several other languages as well as English. Um, people writing in their native languages that come Yeah, I mean, I don't know if I'm right, but I'm sure, pretty sure last census stats were more Polish speakers than Gaelic speakers in, in Scotland. So, you know, it's it's definitely a challenge, you know, beyond the, the indigenous language thing, the prioritisation of that, it must be a challenge, you know, um, although possibly not so much now with, with Brexit. I mean, do, what about in the classroom, Lauren? How does it work with, with Gaelic stuff in, in, in somewhere like Malachi? Um, well, I, I'm, I'm not fluent Gaelic, but I've, I've done it, I've spoken it a lot throughout my life. I went to Solmer Ostig when I left school and things like that, but, um, there is Gaelic medium education here from primary through to secondary. Um, there could possibly be a bit more crossover from Gaelic just in the Gaelic room to a bit more subjects but I think that's kind of well known and it's something that we're working at within the school and within the area um, um it's it's yeah that I've not really there's not really much else to say about it we're we've got such close links with the face here I just can't strengthen how you know we wouldn't it's it, it kind of ties in a little bit with what you know when we were talking just in the last sort of thing we were talking about locality um I think that a lot about music in highlands and islands is the kids will do what's what's available they'll be interested in what's available to them in their area so for instance, we've got loads of kids here that are interested in, in Irish dancing because there's an Irish dance teacher in the village. Mm. Um, and that's just an example, but it's the same. It, it's the, the kids, I think, will be interested in what's around them in a small place. It's just inevitable that will happen. So if um, we've got outside egg uh, partnerships like with Fashion and Gale um, or High Life Highland, then that will kind of blend into what's happening in the school and the classroom and ultimately the the sort of education of the pupils so um, mm -hmm. yeah, that's what I think and do you want to say a few words on that so go on yeah jump in Fiona yeah. I was just going to say what's interesting for us is there's lots of people that I can think of who come to the language and who are now fluent speak Gaelic speakers who live their lives through Gaelic at home mm. um, and at work who maybe didn't have any Gaelic at all right into their you know, started learning in their late teens because they came to it through the music school page. So um, it might be learning fiddle or something and then started to make that connection between the, the music they were playing and the connection to landscape and language and, and song and then pursued studying the language at university. Um, yeah, there's quite a few folk like that that I can think of. Yeah, I know there's, it's, it's an interesting phenomenon. It's a sort of turn of the 21st century phenomenon, that, isn't it, really, you know? Um, Simon, obviously, you know, the whole community is, is mainly Gaelic speaking where you are. Um, and, and UHI obviously has Salmar Ostig and Sky, which does all Gaelic medium. But I mean, how does it, how does it connect? How do you connect with it for the curriculum in, uh, at, at UHI for, for music in third level? Yeah, so you mentioned, you mentioned earlier, you know, uh, US as, as a destination. Although we can we can reach out to people, we do welcome people to come and join us on US. And one of the many attractions uh, of 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 US is the vernacular uh, Gaelic, which is still used in the co communities. Uh, you know, the strongest in, in Scotland, and that's a massive part of the of the landscape. And within UHI, I work for Lewes Castle College, one of the numerous colleges, and that's represents geographically the Western Isles. So again, within the college, uh, which is along with Solarstic, uh, you know, there's lots of Gaelic expertise within that that we can draw upon. I also wanted just to, uh, although we're a broad, inclusive church in, in terms of our 
uh, demographic, uh, geography, and genre, uh, you know, we do reflect the reality of, of Scotland. And there is uh, a prevalence of people who are interested in traditional music uh, on all the culture that surrounds it, it reflects, you know, the people that, that live here. Uh, and we're very pleased when we get people that have maybe come through Lauren's ranks. And certainly, you know, we've got a close, good relationship with, with uh, Fiona at Fish Ross, another fish. Uh, and so we, we tend to see lots of, you know, pipers and fiddlers and class players and, and Gaelic singers that, that join us on applied music and also on music in the environment. And we have within the, the curriculum, uh, you know, we have a module structure. So we really encourage and facilitate individual students to really pursue specialisms and special interests. And we have within, you know, the teaching team through Lewis Castle College and wider in uh, UHI, uh, the expertise for them to really explore that. We also do, I mentioned the uh, collaboration with local stakeholders. So that was, you know, Community Land Scotland. We've worked with numerous local uh, Bodies, the Croc Solo, for example, is with, with Curlis, the Gallic Music and Dance Festival. Uh, and there are other collaborations we've done. We did a collaboration with the, the Western Isles Council to develop a, an early learning app. Uh, and again, we had uh, you know, students that were from the islands that could speak Gallic, but we also managed to include people that have perhaps come from a very different place and a different background and introduce them to it. So it's, yes, it's a central part of the landscape and we, unlike summer Austin, we don't teach through the medium of Gaelic, but we can certainly uh, make great use of it and bring it into all the creative work yeah. that we do. Yeah. No, that's, that's brilliant. So, um, yeah, unless you guys have got any um, final comments that you want to make about the future of music education in, in your sector, I think we've got a really rich discussion today about, you know, the sort of various aspects of it. Um, so um, if there's if there's no other questions from the uh, from everyone else who's here, I just want to thank everybody for coming along and for giving up your time today. Um, I mean, one of the one of the real benefits for people like me, you know, who do research, is that we can actually have these conversations now. We suddenly realised during the pandemic that we can do this online, um, and so I kind of I'm looking forward to maybe some more of these. Uh, you know, over the coming months and years as well, and uh, that's got to be like one of the big benefits, surely, right? Of, of, of coming out of this at the other end, you know. Um, so I want to thank everybody uh, for giving their time today, and uh, I'll make sure I get the um, the the video up on the uh, onto the website at some point um, in the next couple of weeks. So, thanks everybody uh, for coming along. Thanks, Simon. Great. Thanks, Fiona. All the best. Thanks, thanks Simon. Simon, Lauren, thanks so, so much. And also Norman for popping up there as well. Thank you for coming along and explaining all that to us. Thanks to everybody from David. Yeah. Ah, David. <laughs> you well, David? Well, I am now. Thanks to hearing. Yeah, <laughs> yeah good, good stuff. Yeah. Just wish I 